Ben Talbot and his team were descending the rock face. The four-man diving team headed by Ben had been brought in to explore the newly discovered sea caves on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. The island had been cleared of all tourists for the week, so that scientists and divers could observe this latest geographical find. Ben was thrilled to be among the first to see this new wonder. He and his team were no strangers to treacherous diving expeditions, but delving into unexplored territory was dangerous and thrilling. Once the divers were fitted with the cameras that would send a live feed to the scientists on board outside the caves, Ben started the descent. His three teammates, Neil, Horace, and Fabio, followed him. Ben set off toward the seven-foot gaping hole in the rock face. Beneath the visible opening, it went down another ten feet before opening up to a maze of tunnels, the very tunnels that Ben and his team needed to start mapping. They were engulfed in darkness beneath the rock and water. With the beams from their flashlights lighting their way, they set off toward the first of four passageways that needed to be explored. About thirty minutes went by without incident. The tunnel went straight and had ample room for the four men to file through. At one point, a cavern opened. The water was no longer dark. Somewhere above them, sunlight was coming through, and by the video feed leading back to the vessels outside, the crew saw the spacious cave just as the divers did. The divers heard them gasp in their earpieces at the magnificence of the shining streaks of light that cut through the blue water. He would have cheered with the rest on board if he did not have his mouthpiece in. The water level only reached halfway up the cave and the other half was breathable air. He spied a ledge where they could catch their breath and place their equipment while L around. Ben and Fabio climbed onto the flat surface and allowed their cameras to catch as much footage of the cave's upper half as they could. Neil and Horace were still in the water, getting up close to the walls, thoroughly covering every inch they could reach to film. Ben had his face turned upward toward the ceiling, where the specks of light came through tiny cracks in the stone above their heads. He did not realize that the sudden splashing was anything other than the current at first, but Fabio brought Ben back from his intense observations with a hard blow to his shoulder. Ben turned to witness the water coming alive with splashes, screams, and desperate struggles. Horace and Neil found themselves trapped in a sharp corner, with two sharks closing in on them, one shark for each. But two more were slicing the water with their fins, heading straight for their victims. Scuba suits and oxygen tanks weighed down both men. Just keeping afloat was restricting their mobility exponentially. Fearing for his life, Horace desperately attempted to climb the sheer rock wall to escape the hammerhead's relentless attack. However, the water-slicked surface provided no grip, leaving him defenseless and stranded. Horace's efforts were short-lived. He was pulled down by the leg and into the water. On the other hand, Neil had taken to punching every inch of leathery flesh he could reach, aiming for the snouts of his attackers. But he had now been cornered by three of the predators, while the fourth was weaving in and out of the water with a screaming Horus trapped in its jaws. Ben and Fabio were frozen in horror. There was no way to help their companions without being attacked themselves, and the only way out of the cavern was to swim through the vicious animals. The smallest was around ten feet long. The other three were well above the fifteen-foot mark. They'd be dead the moment they touched the water. Within seconds, the screaming had stopped and the only sound was the continuous rage of the water beneath them, as the pack continued to rip apart what was left of their prey. It went on for hours. The stream from their cameras sent every second of the carnage back to the vessels. Soon all that was left were scraps from Neil and Horace's wetsuits, and the grotesque chunks of flesh floating on the surface. Now and then, the flat nose of one of the hammerheads would leap out to grab another morsel, Rescue teams from above could not scale the shark-infested waters to aid the two trapped men. So Ben and Fabio waited in silence except for the occasional splash as the beasts devoured another bite. Hours went by and the night was fast approaching. Ben could not stand the idea of being trapped in the dark with only the sounds of the massacre continuing in the waters. And just as he and Fabio had resigned themselves to spending the night on the ledge, there was a blast like a cannon from above, and the water was showered with rock shards. They were blowing the roof open. If rescue services couldn't enter from the bottom, they would blow their way in from the top. The men below hugged the wall and each other to avoid the raining missiles. 
Luckily, it only took one blow to open a hole large enough for them to lower a rope and harness. Ben sent Fabio up first and was hoisted up himself a few minutes later. He came out into the open air just as the sun was about to go down. The men did not take notice of the news crews and crowds that had gathered. The relief was so intense that they saw nothing but the open air and each other still miraculously alive. No burial could be held for Neil and Horace, since they could not retrieve their bodies. Instead, their families held awake, hoping to find some sense of closure. Fabio would retire from diving but never recovered from the ordeal. And Ben, even though that day would never cease to haunt his dreams, went on to explore the world's waters for many years. But he never could bring himself to dive off the coasts of the Hawaiian Islands again. The group of college students was spread out over the beach. The eight young women decided to cheer on the boys instead of joining in on the game themselves. Their six male companions were playing a game of volleyball in the water. Their weekend getaway to the sunny Florida beach was almost at an end, and this was the last day they could relax before heading back to classes. The game was in full swing when a siren went off overhead, making all of them turn in the direction of the sound. The group spotted lifeguards riding through the crowd on dirt bikes, announcing over megaphones that there had been a sighting of a shark, and everyone needed to get out of the water immediately. The students groaned, but none grumbled louder than Garrett Langston. But then again, he was always louder than anybody else. Garrett was on the varsity lacrosse team and well known for being the class clown. Boisterous and energetic, he had the ability to raise the spirits of even the dullest of crowds. The girls started to pack up the coolers and towels. There was no use hanging around when they couldn't go back in the water anyway. And five of the guys traipsed out of the waves, ready to help the girls clean up and finish off the last of their drinks. But Garrett remained in the surf, dead set on getting a few more minutes of the splash. He was calling the others back inside, and surely the sighting had taken place miles away. They still had plenty of time left to finish the game. The beach emptied of people and Garrett stayed stubbornly in the water. Jeremy Davids, Garrett's best friend, promised to drive off without him if Garrett wasn't out of the water when the group had finished packing. They were both still laughing, knowing full well that this was an empty threat, when Garrett's head yanked under the water. An 18-foot Great White had been aware of all of them for hours. Its keen senses had picked up on human scent far out at sea. It was hunting searching for the easiest meal among the hundreds of bodies in the shallows. With the sudden emptying of its hunting ground, it went for the only remaining option, the young man swimming ever deeper into the ocean, which is deep enough for it to strike. It happened so quickly that Garrett's smiling face did not even change expression when he was swiftly submerged in the water. Jeremy knew this was not one of Garrett's pranks. It was too sudden. He wasted no time to react. Jeremy sprinted off in the direction of the waves, yelling for help. He was already waist-deep in the water before the group realized what Jeremy was screaming about. They rushed after him just as Jeremy launched himself into the surf, heading for the spot where Garrett had disappeared. Jeremy, intent on swimming, did not see what the others witnessed. Amidst the violent splashes where Garrett had been, they saw the water turn red, the pool of blood spreading darkly. It was impossible to tell which limbs were Garrett's, and where the shark was in the middle of the violent thrashing. Garrett's torso emerged briefly, screaming for help, only to be pulled back down. Jeremy had just lifted his head for air when Garrett came up. Horrified, he pumped his arms as fast as he could muster. Jeremy had not spared a thought of what he could do once he reached his friend. He just knew that he needed to get to Garrett before it was too late. When Jeremy reached the spot of turbulent limbs and splashing, everything went ominously quiet. The only movement was the now red-dyed current. Jeremy swam back and forth, desperately searching. He did not even care that the predator was still somewhere in the water with him. He only had his attention on finding Garrett. Behind him, his classmates started screaming. He spun around, expecting to see the shark there. But it was Garrett. Jeremy instantly knew that he had been too late. What was left of Garrett was limp and slowly moving along with the soft waves. Garrett was face down. His back was shredded beyond recognition. Jeremy reached the body just as the Coast Guards arrived at the water's edge, responding to the college students' shouts of alarm. They helped Jeremy drag Garrett to the shore. 
The crowd that had gathered to observe the spectacle dispersed with hysterical screams as they saw the horrifying sight of the young man laid out on the sand, broken and motionless. Lifeguards did not attempt to resuscitate him. There was barely any part of him left intact to bring back. All they could do was wait for the ambulance to arrive. The friends, desperate not to look at the terrible scene any longer, busied themselves with keeping the last of the crowd at bay. Jeremy, on the other hand, was numb with horror. He stared helplessly at his friend's body and did not even notice the lifeguards who were trying to console him. Garrett's body was loaded into an ambulance and Jeremy was wheeled into a second vehicle to be treated for shock. But this was a trauma that he would never fully recover from. His happy-go-lucky soul brother had been taken from him in the worst way possible, all because the gravity of the situation had not been taken seriously. Jeremy resigned from the lacrosse team. He couldn't bear to play the field without Garrett's laughter ringing above the spectators. Rodrigo and Vincentia were standing on the rocky outcrop. Vincentia wanted to go in the water with the men to pull up the nets, but as a girl she was expected to assist the women on the beach. She would much rather be doing the hard work than minding children. On the other hand, her twin brother Rodrigo wanted to be in her place, not in the water alongside his father. The gentle 17-year-old did not like the boisterous bravado or the shows of masculinity among the men. The siblings would have been all too happy to trade places. They both stood almost six feet tall. The only one taller than them in the party of 43 fishermen was their father, George Hernandez. The Hernandez family was known for their height across the small fishing village of Santa Georgina. The Hernandez family and their companions had all grown up alongside the Peruvian waters, fishing to sustain themselves, just like their forefathers before them. When the nets were thrown into the water, Vincentia inched closer, hoping to blend into the crowd, but her tall frame made her impossible to miss. The men sternly chased Vincentia back to the women and Rodrigo was called to join them. They both sighed and set off in opposite directions, Vincentia grumbling her displeasure. Rodrigo was placed at the deepest end of the net, and soon they were pulling the first haul in. Fish were dragged in, collected by the women and girls, and brought to the beach, where they would gut each one. The entrails were thrown back into the water, where even more fish would be attracted to the bait. The bloody water was very effective in attracting fish, not just the ones the fishermen were after. Beneath the surface, a 15-foot male bull shark was already heading toward the smell of the bloody entrails. Its keen senses had picked up the alluring scent of blood two miles away. The men were oblivious to the danger swimming beneath the surface and continued on the job. As the men pulled the net closer, they unknowingly drew the predator nearer. The shark set off after the retreating catch. From below, the beast opened its maw to grab at the school of fish. Rodrigo was standing chest deep in the water, his hands full with the fish-laden net, when he saw the appearance of the fin right in front of him. He barely had a chance to register his shock, before the body and head of the bull shark followed the gray triangle. The animal was rearing to rip into the net, unaware that the boy was less than two meters in front of it. Its jaws closed instead on Rodrigo's right thigh. He was ripped beneath the water so swiftly that the net was yanked out of the other fishermen's hands. They looked on in horror, and before they could respond to the sudden attack, Rodrigo appeared above the water again. He was being dragged through the water as easily as a child's toy boat, a macabre torpedo racing through the depths, propelled by the monstrous force that gripped him. The boy's thigh was trapped in the shark's jaws, and he felt powerless against its strength. The shark relentlessly thrashed, trying to detach Rodrigo's limb. The men in the water were still frozen, and the few who had come to their senses had streaked out of the water to safety. Before the rest could follow suit, Vincentia was sprinting toward them. Her long legs had her at the water's edge in seconds, eyes never leaving the sight of her thrashing brother as she bound onto the rocky outcrop. Vincentia crossed the uneven rock and without breaking her speed, she leapt through the air, aiming right for her brother and his attacker. Her aim was true. She landed, hitting the animal in the space between his head and fin. Her bent elbow stretched out like a missile. Vincentia's full weight bore down on the beast. She barreled it down into the water by a good two meters. When Vincentia came up, she was ready to fight it with her bare hands if she had to. 
but the shark had released her brother and was speeding away from them. This was not the easy catch that it had anticipated at all. Vincentia reeled around searching for Rodrigo, but her father and the rest of the men had already grabbed the young man, and they were swimming him to the beach. She could hear him screaming in agony. He was alive. Vincentia struck out for the beach and headed straight for Rodrigo. She did not shrink at the sight of his mangled and bleeding leg. Instead, she threw him over her shoulder and sprinted to the small family car. Vincentia was not going to wait for the dumbfounded men and women to come to their senses. Her father, George, was the only one sober enough to follow her. He had already removed his shirt and was tying it to Rodrigo's leg to staunch the flow even as his daughter started the car. Rodrigo lost consciousness and 20 minutes later, he arrived at the hospital unaware of their arrival. Medical personnel rushed him into surgery, but it was too late to save his leg. The decision was made to amputate just below the hip. Every member of the Hernandez family, even Rodrigo, knew that losing his leg was nothing compared to the alternative. A beast that large could have killed Rodrigo. And yet, amazingly, he was still here with them. Though Rodrigo could no longer join the men in the water, he didn't miss it at all. He found that there was more than enough for him to be content on the beach with the women and a few pretty girls his age to keep him company too. Vincentia, on the other hand, would not allow the men to chase her back ever again. She confidently strode into the surf, taking her place next to her father. Vincentia had earned her place among them, and she had done what none of them had dared to do. Vincentia was a fisherman, girl or not, and she was more capable and stronger than almost all of them.